So this video is another in the beginner core topics series. So if you want to know how parity works, how disk arrays work, the differences between traditional RAID and unraid, well, then this video is for you. Hi there. Right. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about parity. I'm going to be talking about what it is and how it works. Also, I'm going to be talking about how the Unraid Array uses it, why the Unraid Array uses it, how it does, and the differences between a regular RAID Array and the Unraid Main Disk Array and also its pools. So let's start. What is parity? Well, let's see what the definition is. So the dictionary definition of parity, it says it's the state or condition of being equal, or in mathematics, the fact of being even or odd, and similar words are equality, equivalence, uniformity, sameness, etc. So let's have a look at the definition in regards to computing. And it says here a function whose being even or odd provides a check on a set of binary values. So what does that mean, providing a check on a set of binary values? So I'm sure we all know that the language computers speak is binary, all ones and zeros. Well, it means basically checking when a binary message is sent from one place to another, whether there's an error present or not. So let's take two computers sending a message to each other over the network. Now we know data is sent in packets and packets, they can be different sizes. So let's take a one byte packet. And as we know, one byte is made up of eight bits, as we can see represented here. So an eight bit binary message may look a bit like this. So if the sending computer on the left sends this packet to the receiving computer on the right, how does the receiving computer actually know that the message is actually correct? There may have been noise that corrupted data along this transmission. For example, the last one here, that bit may have been flipped and may appear as a zero. So as this data is sent at the moment, the receiving computer has no way of knowing that there's an error. And that's because in our packet, all of the eight bits, they're all data bits. But if we were to construct our packet differently and only have seven data bits and one parity bit, this will allow us to check whether there's an error present in the packet. So let's use the bit on the end as our parity bit and let's color it red. So remember when we looked up the definition of parity, where it's going on about things being even, about numbers being odd or even. Well, to use a parity bit, our computers need to decide whether they're going to use odd parity or even parity. And so in our example here, the computers are going to be using even parity. So what this means is the number of ones contained in the packet will always be even. That's why the computers have agreed on even parity. So here, if we look at our packet, we can see the seven data bits have four ones there and four ones there even. So that means our parity bit needs to be written as a zero. So the sum of all of the ones is still even. There's still an even number of ones there. So now when this data packet is sent to the receiving computer, the receiving computer knows that even parity is being used. And so it can see the number of ones in the packet, they are even. So the data checks out as being correct. So let's look at that again, but with some different data. So this packet contains three ones. So at the moment, there's an odd number of ones in the data. So to make the packet even, we need to add a one as the parity bit, therefore making the number of ones in the packet even. So now when this is sent to the receiving computer, again, it knows that even parity is being used and the number of ones in this packet are all even. So again, the data checks out as being correct. So now let's see what happens when something goes wrong and a bit of data gets corrupted. So during transmission, this first one flips to be a zero. So when this packet is received by the receiving computer, because we're using even parity, for the computer to know the data is correct, so all the ones must add up and be even. So how many ones have we got? Well, we've got three ones in this packet and three certainly isn't even. So the receiving computer knows that there's some error that's happened in the transfer of this data. And so the receiving computer is going to say back to the sender, hey, I didn't quite get that. Can you send it to me again? And then the sending computer will send that same data again. And hopefully this time it will get through without any interference and come through correct. 
So the parity bit will basically tell the receiver whether there's an error there, but it won't say what the actual error is. So it's a bit like us having a conversation on the phone. And I say to you, watch my new video on my and forget to subscribe to the channel. And so your brain and common sense, that's your kind of parity check. And you think to yourself, when did he say to watch the new video? I didn't hear that. And surely he couldn't have said, forget to subscribe to the channel. That makes no sense. So you say, pardon. And then I say, watch my new video on Monday and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. So you see the parity bit can't correct the data itself. In order for the data to be corrected, the whole piece of data needs to be sent again. Now parity, it sounds pretty good, but it can't actually catch all errors. For instance, if we resend this packet again, and this time two parts of data become corrupted, we'll see what the problem is. So here a one has flipped to a zero and a zero has flipped to a one. And so because of this, there's still actually an even number of ones. So as far as the parity checks concerned, this is correct, even though the data is different. So as you can see, a parity bit can detect errors, but not all errors. And also it can't automatically correct errors. It can only tell us that there's an error there. Now, if you're interested in things that can automatically correct errors, do a search and look up something called Hamming codes. And you can see how multiple parity bits can actually auto correct data. But I'm not going to be talking about that in this video. OK, so now we know a little bit about parity. Let's see how parity can be used for redundancy when storing data on disks. So let's rotate this block around and think about it how it applies to these disks. So now instead of having a parity bit, we've got a parity disk. And as we know, disks store information as ones and zeros as well. And they do that on their sectors. And depending on the size of the disk, depends on how many sectors that disk actually has. Now to make it easier for this video, I'm talking about parity being used over sectors of disks. But the parity is actually over the bit position on the disk. And generally a sector on a disk is 512 bytes, which is 4096 bits. But just for simplification in this video, we're going to talk about the sectors on the disk instead. So let's take these eight disks. Well, in fact, let's get rid of one of these disks and imagine that this is an unraid main array and choose three different sectors, maybe sector 100, 5000 and sector 10,000. So now let's put some data on these disks. Now the unraid array uses even parity. So when you do a parity sync, it calculates the ones and zeros across each sector. And on the parity, it writes either a one or zero to make sure the sum of everything is always even. So let's look across the disks on sector 100. So we've got four ones across this sector. So that means it's already even. So for sector 100 on the parity disk, it's going to write a zero. OK, so sector 5000 now, across here we've got three ones, which is odd. So for the parity disk on sector 5000, it needs to be a one to make it even. And finally, sector 10,000 here, again across here we've got four ones, so that's already even. So the parity disk sector 10,000, that will write a zero. So as we're not checking for an error in the data being transmitted as such, Although some people would say we are transmitting a message while we write data from the present to us sometime in the future when we read that back. So let's simulate disk two failing. So unlike before, when we were looking at parity in binary messages being sent from one place to another, we didn't know where the error is. But obviously when we have a disk fail, you know exactly where the error is. So because we know where the error is, that allows us to be able to actually error correct and know what that missing data should be so we don't lose any data. So let's calculate the data on the failed disk too. So taking sector 100, we can see on our parity we've got a zero. And if we add up the ones, we can see we've got three ones. So because we're using even parity and we've only got three ones and we've got a zero for the parity, then we know the data on disk two on sector 100 is definitely a one. And sector 5000, We've got four ones, which is even. So sector 5,000 was definitely a zero. And sector 10,000, we've got three ones, a zero for our parity. So to make it even, this two sector 5,000 must have been a one. So with a failed disk that hasn't been replaced, 
the data is corrected and so therefore emulated and we can still access all of the data. But replacing the failed drive from the emulated data, this is written onto the disk and then we're back to how we were with all of our data intact. So now you can see how a parity disk actually protects your array. It doesn't actually contain any actual real data on it, only the ones and zeros that make all the others add up to be even for our even parity. And how this is all calculated is using something called an XOR algorithm. An XOR being short for exclusive OR. Now we'll talk more about exclusive OR in a moment, but for now I want to talk about the differences between the unraid array and a standard array, which also has one disk's worth of parity. Let's compare it to RAID 5. Okay, so on an unraid array, the parity is not kept on any of the data disks at all. It's kept separate on its own disk. Now in RAID 5, this is slightly different because the parity is striped across the disks along with the data. In this picture here, the parity being represented in the orange. So the parity is striped across all of the disks. And as well as the parity being striped, the data is also striped across the disks as well. So one file may not reside just on one disk, it's cut up into little pieces and written across all of the disks. Now this has both advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are, because all of the disks are being used all at once with read and writes, the read and writes are faster. But this comes with its own set of disadvantages. Because the parity is striped across all of the disks, it means all of the disks have to be the same size. You can't have mixed size disks. Well, actually that's not 100% true. If you were to make a RAID 5 array with mixed size disks, then on each disk the usable space would only be that of the smallest disk. For example, if you had two 10 terabyte disks and one 2 terabyte disk, the 10 terabyte disks would only have two terabytes used. So from that array, you'd only have a usable space of four terabytes. And that's because the two 10 terabyte disks, because of the two terabyte disk present in the array, would only act as a two terabyte drive themselves. And another disadvantage of having the parity striped across the disks means you can't add an additional disk to the array. You can't add either another data disk or a parity disk to an existing RAID 5 array. And the easiest way to show why you can't do this is to show you why on an unraid array where the parity isn't striped that we can do it. Right, so here we are back on our unraid disk array. Now if you remember earlier, I said I was going to take one disk out, the disk 7. Well, there is a reason for that, because I wanted to show you how we'd add a disk in. So imagine the disk 7 is inside the server, ready to be added to the array. So how can it be added without messing up the parity? Well, that's easy. By writing each sector to this disk, with a zero. And so because these zeros don't change the parity calculation at all, sector 100, 5000 and 1000, they're all still even parity if you have a look. And because the parity is still valid, should any data disk fail, well, the data can be rebuilt. So when you add a disk to an unraid array, unraid does what's called clearing, where it zeroes all of the disk before adding it to the array. My preferred way of doing it is to use the pre-clear plugin and setting that to zero the drive and then afterwards read back all the zeros to check it's been done correctly. And there's two reasons I do it this way. Firstly, because it stress tests a new drive by actually reading back the data as well. And also just to be 100% sure everything zeros before I put it in the array, just to make sure my parity will be valid. And on a side note, another thing that's interesting about the unraid array and zeroing a drive is if you want to remove a drive from the unraid array, you can actually do that if you zero the drive and then remove it, that won't affect the parity either. And I'll be showing how to do that in an upcoming video later this week, where I show various ways to shrink an unraid array. And another advantage of having a dedicated parity disk is the fact that we can use multiple size disks in our array. The only rule being is that the parity disk must at least be as large as the largest disk in the array. So taking the example we've got here. Now imagine the largest disks in the array here, they have 10,000 sectors and the other disks only have 5,000. So imagine the 5,000 sector disks are like five terabytes and the 10,000 disks are 10 terabytes. Now, of course, this number's totally arbitrary. Disks are gonna have much more sectors than that. 
But here, imagine that the parity disc, disc 1, 2, and 3 are 10 terabytes, and disc 4, 5, 6, and 7 are 5 terabytes. With the mixed size drives, the full size of each disc can be used, and it doesn't affect the parity because the parity data is not striped across the data drives. Now, also an Unraid array, it doesn't stripe its data across the disks. It writes individual files and folders to individual disks without breaking up the files, spreading them across multiple disks. Now, this has an advantage because you can take any disk out of the array and put it in another computer and read the data off it. But also, like in this example here, I have more than one disk fail and I can't build it back from parity. Well, I've only lost the data on the two disks that have failed. All the other disks are better to have the data still. Okay, so now let's just think of the advantages and disadvantages between a RAID 5 array and an unraid array. So to read or write data from a RAID 5 array, all disks must be spun up. To read or write data from an unraid array, to write data, two disks need to be spun up, to read data, only one. Because of this, an unraid array will use less electricity than a RAID 5 array would so long as the disk is set to spin down during periods of inactivity. Also, because a RAID 5 array reads and writes to all of the disks at once, then the wear across these disks is uniform and even, because all disks are used equally. This is not the case on an unraid array. The parity disk will have the most activity during writes. It will always be written to. So, of course, this could be considered a disadvantage, because obviously the more a disk is used, the quicker it reaches its end of life. So for this reason, I'd really recommend that your parity drive is a very good quality disk. Your parity disk don't use a shucked drive. And by a shucked drive, I mean one that used to be in a USB enclosure and was sold as an external USB drive. Manufacturers will sometimes put drives in these enclosures that don't come up to standard for what they'd sell for the higher costing internal drives. This isn't always the case, but it's something to keep in mind and think about why these disks actually cost less than their non-external counterparts. So going back to the RAID 5, whilst you could think it's advantageous to have all the disks have equal wear, if you look at it from another perspective, this means that when a disk comes to its end of life and it fails, there's a high chance that the other disks in the array will also fail too, or they'll fail shortly as they've all had the same amount of wear and tear and will have all been bought at the same time. This isn't the case in an unraid server because the disks won't all have equal wear and because you can actually add disks to the array, the disks probably won't all be the same age, which obviously brings us to another point that we we're talking about earlier. An unraid array, you can add extra data disks to it as time goes on. And you can even add an extra parity disk if you want two parity disks which will allow the Unraid array to have two drives fail and for you to be able to recover. Now, I will talk briefly about dual parity in Unraid towards the end of this video, but for the time being, I'm going to ignore it. Yeah, but going back to RAID 5, as we know, the array can't be expanded at all. Okay, so both a RAID 5 array and a one parity disk Unraid array can recover from one failed drive. But what happens if more than one drive fails? What happens then? Well, on a RAID 5 array, you lose the whole array and all the data on that array. But on an unraid array, you only lose the data that's on those failed disks. And as we saw earlier, this is because unraid doesn't stripe data across disks. It just writes to each individual disk one at a time. So another thing to think about during a data rebuild is that during the rebuild, both on a RAID 5 array and an unraid array, all of the disks need to be read from, which sounds fine. But what happens if you've got some bad sectors you haven't seen on the disks and you get an unrecoverable read error or a URE? Well, if this happens on a RAID 5 array during rebuild, the rebuild will fail and the rebuild will stop. However, on an unraid array, if you get an unrecoverable read error during rebuild, it will just skip that sector. And yes, the data will be corrupted in that sector, but the rebuild will continue. So at worst, some of your data will be corrupted but you'll still be able to get the large amount of it back. Okay, so the last thing to think about is on a RAID 5 array, because the data and the parity is striped across all of the disks, then reads and writes are going to be faster than on an unraid array where the data and the parity isn't striped. And so the reason I'm mentioning this last is because I thought it would be a good segue into speaking about unraid cache pools. So to combat the slower write speeds on an array, 
A number of years ago, Lime Technology introduced having a cache drive and more recently introduced cache pools. So this allows files to be written first to a fast SSD and then later on, normally during the night, a program called Mover will then move that data onto the main array. So what happens if the SSD fails? Well, we can use pools of SSD devices in a BTRFS or ButterFS RAID. And here with these two SSDs, this is a BTRFS RAID 1, where the data is mirrored across the two drives. So this gives us redundancy should one of the SSDs fail before the data has been moved onto the main array. And BTRFS RAID is very similar to conventional RAID. RAID 0, the data is striped between two disks, so the reads and writes are very fast. RAID 1, as we said a moment ago, is a simple mirror, which gives us guaranteed redundancy. And RAID 10, basically that's a combination of RAID 0 and RAID 1. And RAID 5 and 6 are parity RAIDs with either one disk of redundancy or two. Now, I don't really recommend using RAID 5 or RAID 6 in ButterFS. A lot of people say that RAID 5 and RAID 6 in ButterFS isn't stable enough to use. And I think the general consensus is not to use RAID 5 or 6 with ButterFS RAID. And we're not limited to one of these pools, we can have multiple pools. And you can see a video about setting up multiple pools here. Now it's rumoured that ZFS is coming to Unraid soon, maybe in version 6.11. Now this is something I think a lot of people, myself included, are really looking forward to, as it will allow us to create Unraid ZFS pools. Now in fact we can actually use ZFS on Unraid at the moment with the use of a plugin. And if you want to see about doing that, then see my video here. Now, the one thing I haven't really spoken about much about the Unraid array is using two parity disks. Now, a lot of people mistakenly think that the two parity drives are just a mirror of each other. Well, if that was the case, the only thing the second parity disk could protect is if the first parity disk failed. Well, as we know, having two parity disks allows us to have two drives fail in the array, so the second parity disk is definitely not just a copy of the first. So the first parity disk is called the P drive, and it uses the XOR or exclusive OR algorithm. And the second parity disk is called the Q drive, and this uses another algorithm called a Reed Solomon algorithm. This is the same algorithm as what's used to correct scratches when playing back something like a CD or DVD. Now, I'm not going to talk about the Reed Solomon algorithm, but I did say I was going to talk a little bit more about the exclusive OR. So you may have heard of Bitwise AND and OR in computer programming and its negative counterpart Bitwise NAND and OR. Well, Bitwise Exclusive OR is from this same family. So we know computers use binary and if we think as 1 is equaling true and 0 is equaling false, you may want to find out if two conditions have been met because you may be trying to find out if something is a 1 and something else is a 0. And with these two conditions, we have something called a truth table, which looks like this. This is the truth table for normal OR. So imagine condition A is, is it wet? And condition B is, have I slipped over? And so we want to know if one of those conditions have been met. So in the first column, the zero is false. So it isn't wet and I haven't slipped over. So obviously the result will be false. In the second column, is it wet? No, a zero. And have I slipped over? Yes, a 1, that's true. So the result is true. The next column is the reverse. It is wet, but I haven't slipped over. So one of the conditions has been met, so that's a true. And finally, the last column, it is wet and I have slipped over. So even though both of those conditions are true, well, one of them is 2, so the result is a 1. OK, so that's the bitwise OR operation. So now let's look at the bitwise exclusive OR. Now this is very similar except that last column. In exclusive OR, it's got to exclusively be one or the other. So obviously the last column, where both conditions are met, instead of that now being true, that's now considered false. Because only one condition can be met in order to be true. Hence the name exclusive OR. So you may be thinking, well how does that relate to the Unraid array and the parity? Well, like I said, we were using the exclusive OR algorithm to calculate the odd and even. And we imagine the result is the parity disk. Well, if you look at the first column, a 0 and a 0 is even. So again, the parity would be a 0. And the next column, a 0 and a 1 is odd. So to make the parity even, that would be written a 1. The same with the next column, 
and the last column a one and a one is even so a zero would be written to the parity so using the xor algorithm this is how the result is calculated so i'm sure some of you are thinking well that's very well for just two conditions which would be like two discs but what about four discs how does this work with that so what we do is start at the top and xor the first two numbers the disc one and two so if we look at our truth table a 1 and a 1 is a 0. So we take our result and then XOR that with the next disk, disk 3. And a 0 and a 0. Well, the result of that is 0. And finally, we take our result from that and we XOR it with disk 4. So a 0 and a 1. Well, the result is true. So the answer is 1. So now that means all of the disks have been exclusive ORD. So that means this final one will be the result for the parity. Okay, so that's how parity is calculated with the XOR algorithm. And so now at the end of this video, hopefully you know a little bit more about parity, RAID and the UnRAID array. Now this video is much longer than I thought it was going to be. So it's time to wrap this up now and finish the video. Now I wanted to make this video about parity and the UnRAID array because my next video I'm going to be demonstrating how to shrink an UnRAID array. And I think having an understanding of parity is really useful for that. Anyway guys, it's time for me to go now. But if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to share the video with everyone who you think might find it useful. I want to thank all of my Patreons and supporters out there for supporting this channel. Thank you so much guys for enabling me to make these videos. And if anyone else out there wants to help and support the channel, then please find the links in the description below. Anyway guys, it's time for me to go now, but whatever you're up to for the rest of the day, I hope it's good, and I'll catch you in the next video.